very much indeed, both Peter and Harriet, for, for inviting me and for organizing this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, I suppose I feel I should confess that I think it's only the second time I've put a shirt on during lockdown, but that <laughs> may say something more about me than about lockdown. Um, what I hope to do in the, the next 40 minutes or so um, is uh, talk somewhat uh, to some degree about um, the work I've been doing primarily in the last, in total, 20 years uh, on Sicily. Uh, it's going to be a talk as much about methods, or indeed more about methods, than it is about history as such. Um, and uh, I hope we'll raise a number of, of questions uh, around how we actually try to do epigraphy in the digital age. It's not unique to epigraphy, and they're not questions that are necessarily unique to digital scholarship either. Um, but uh, digital approaches have uh, very much foregrounded many of these issues. Um, so this is the point where we attempt the technology and hopefully now you can all see my screen and all I can see is me, um, the ideal academic audience talking to oneself. So um, the starting point really necessarily is Sicily. If I can work out how to advance my slides, there we go. Which is a remarkable uh, opportunity in a sense to study um, a real cultural melting point, Brodel's continent in miniature, um, and uh, a genuinely fascinating cultural crossroads at the heart of the ancient Mediterranean, famous for many things, uh, a selection in the current slide, be that the Phoenician colony at Mozia, um, the Greek temples of Segesta, Selenunte, Agrigento, or for example, the mosaics of the great late Roman villa at Piazza Armarina. Um, but pointing to all of those already points to one of the fundamental problems in a sense of trying to study ancient Sicily, which is how I want to uh, approach this, uh, this talk. Um, and that really is to think about the historiographic problem and how we then try to address some sort of history of ancient Sicily. Um, a history which in the modern terms, times starts with the account of Tommaso Fazzello de Rebus Siculis in 1558, which already set out an account which was very much that immortally encapsulated in the words of the Prince of Salina in Lampedusa's Gattopardo. For over 25 centuries, we've been bearing the weight of superb and heterogeneous civilizations, all from outside, none made by ourselves, none that we could call our own. Um, slightly more problematically perhaps, uh, captured uh, in a letter of Moses Finley while he was writing his history of ancient Sicily, writing to uh, his co-author, the modern historian of modern Italy, Dennis Mac Smith. If you start the whole story of outside alien invaders with them, that is the Greeks, you are left with the obviously intolerable position that the pre-Greek sickles, etc., are the only true Sicilians. I think we must treat the Greeks apart, not as colonialists, but as genuine Sicilians. They were there long enough. Now, for all of the potential problems of that informal set of observations, um, it captures the essential problem, which is that around how do we describe, how do we approach culture on an island which is subject to repeated incomings of more or less uh, um, uh, polemical uh, inc incomers, uh, Phoenicians, Greeks, Italians, Romans, uh, and on uh, into the later antiquity with the Vandals and others. Um, and on top of that, the challenge of how we write a history when the literary sources themselves, also fundamentally Greco-Roman, um, are also very partial both from their Hellenocentrism, their Romanocentrism, but also in terms of what they're interested in and what they choose to talk about over time. So that the narrative of ancient Sicily from our ancient sources essentially stops in 212 BC with the sack of Syracuse here captured in a later Roman mosaic depicting the famous story of Archimedes killed by the Roman soldier while puzzling out a maths problem. Um, and the only significant textual light, literary source light that we get on the island thereafter, uh, the even more notorious uh, 
speeches of Cicero against the governor Verres, here in turn immortalized and reused uh, and reproduced uh, in 18th century British imperial context in the caricature of Edmund Burke prosecuting Warren Hastings, um, the governor of India. Um, to take one very specific example, the city of Palermo is mentioned by Strabo uh, in the Augustan period as becoming a colonia. The next time the major city of Palermo is mentioned in the literary sources is during the conquest by Belisarius for the Byzant reconquest by the Byzantines uh, in, described by Procopius referring to 535 AD. Um, so for five centuries, Palermo simply doesn't appear in a literary text, in a narrative. Um, there is a real challenge in writing a history where there is no narrative structure. Uh, and as uh, Adolf Holm, the historian of ancient, of ancient Sicily once wrote, once conquered by Rome, a province has no history of its own. Um, so runs the, the, the grand narrative view. There is therefore fundamentally a need for different approaches, other sources, most obviously, for example, archeology, span but unsurprisingly, the source that I'm interested in, the source I want to talk about is what we can potentially get from epigraphy. What is epigraphy? Um, epigraphy is broadly the study of texts written on more or less durable materials, including stone, metal, ceramic, and indeed just about any other more or less durable material that you can think of. Um, uh, it is therefore the, uh, if you like, the contemporary written word, not generally the high literary written word, though very often produced by um, the elite, but also produced by a much broader social range and a very diverse range of categories and contexts. Therefore offers a very different window and a very uh, localized and specific set of windows onto what is going on in an area and the lives and the activities of people in the region. And it runs, the, the, the texts run into the thousands. Um, over the period of the 1500 or so years uh, in which they're produced in classical antiquity, ranging from the late 7th century BC, one 200 years into the arrival of the Greeks and the Phoenicians, through to uh, the, the end of late antiquity, um, the 6th, 7th century AD, when as a practice it largely disappears again. We can look at the examples of individual inscriptions, um, which on the one hand, and as they have most commonly been used um, in broader historical writing, um, offer us uh, windows on glimpses in contributions to great history, if you like. So in this instance, a monumental statue base for the King Hero and the Second of Syracuse, um, uh, reflecting uh, the presence of great people, big history, political history, um, captured uh, in a range of such documents. Um, an example from Catania, a letter written by uh, one of the uh, imperial officials, Julius Paternus, to the emperors, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Ferus, in the second century CE, um, relating to a financial dispute within the city of Catania, or Roman colonia at that date. So epigraphy can feed directly into political institutional uh, history at the monumental level. It can feed into civic history at the same time, um, uh, and more specifically, so examples here of monumental public inscriptions from the ancient city of Taormina um, on the east coast of Sicily, um, blocks uh, well over a meter in, in, in length, uh, in, engraved in tiny letters, lists of the civic magistrates, details of the city accounts year by year, um, giving us very detailed, if very particular, light on uh, local economic, uh, social, institutional history. But it's more diverse than that. It is not simply about, if you like, um, those uh, primary areas of, if you like, traditional history. Sicily is a highly multilingual, uh, diverse region. One of the things that epigraphy offers uh, light on, uh, which we don't get from any other source, is, for example, the languages of those problematic indigenous peoples for Finley, the Elimians, as they're described in our literary sources at one end of the island, the Sickles at the other. Uh, the epigraphic texts, for the most part engraved on pottery, provide the only evidence for the languages in use at that time, but also immediately take us into the world of uh, social cultural interchanges, um, as in order to write that language, they're adopting and adapting variations on the local Greek alphabet. In this case, the Selenuntine alphabet, uh, distinguished in particular by um, the use of this strange reversed N symbol, <coughs> which is the Selenuntine version of, uh, on the south coast of Sicily, of the letter beta. Um, or 
at the other side of the island, the sickle uh, language in use by the peoples on the eastern side of the island, where again, this adoption and adaption of local Greek alphabets, uh, which themselves are evolving and changing city by city, allows one to trace the regional areas of interaction between the various Greek cities on the coast and the uh, indigenous communities in the interior, following patterns of precisely uses of alphabets uh, as they move, and in this case, the distinctive letter known as the alpha siculum, found in some Greek texts, but then more widely adopted across some of these sickle texts on the island, and tracing not simply the text, but actually the letter forms, which is something I'll come back to at the end, offers further options to actually begin to get a grasp on these levels of interaction. And texts as a whole um, of less monumental varieties um, shed light on the interactions of peoples uh, in different places. Um, so a Demeter, a dedication here to Demeter inscribed on the base of a statue where the list of names in Greeks ranges through a variety of Roman and Italian, Italic names, Gaius or Chaos, Lucius, Kylios, and also Greek names, Chiretios, Nymphon, and others. Uh, in a period before the Verines in the early years of the Roman Republican province and suggesting already therefore a much greater level of interaction although the dynamics behind that interaction become, are much less clear uh, than we would be able to get from, for example, literary sources alone or necessarily from the archaeology. And lastly, but by no means least, since somewhere in excess of 70% of most surviving inscribed stones are tombstones, funerary inscriptions, um, funerary inscriptions offer a huge window in particular onto a whole range of interactions that are much more subtle and much harder to trace, not perhaps so subtle in this particular case, you can probably see where I'm going with this one already, a Greek funerary inscription, but the age of death is recorded in Roman numerals. This in the Roman colonia of Catania on the east coast of Sicily, which is in origin a Greek colonial foundation. Uh, but there are other interactions going on linguistically here as well. The um, uh, well-known use of Theta Kappa, which is a Greek version of the abbreviation of Dis Manibus in Latin, but the very practice of abbreviating is itself a Roman practice that one does not traditionally find in Greek epigraphy, and therefore a series of interactions going on across texts. The challenge, however, is that we can do that with individual texts, but to start to do more than that, to start to exploit all of those texts, to explore all of those different things, often very subtle nuances and shifts across texts and over time, requires access to as much of the material as possible in as much detail as possible. And there are challenges in studying this sort of material. One basic challenge is that of accessibility. Um, it's the challenges as a whole that I want to really address and tie into going digital through the rest of this paper. Um, so, Sicilian epigraphy inscriptions were being published from a very early date. There's already the Corpus of Gualtheris in 1624 that gathered in excess of 300 inscriptions. And Sicily was well represented in the monumental Berlin Corpus projects, the Corpus of Latin inscriptions, the Corpus of Greek inscriptions, um, published from the 1880s onwards. Uh, indeed, in some ways too well represented because it's in the very early volumes of that project. Um, those corpora present their own challenges and limitations. Uh, publication practices of the time uh, mean that what you get is texts and little more, um, and the supporting documentation is all in Latin because that was the sensible universal scholarly language of the time. Um, that, however, for example, immediately loses one of the obvious features of many inscriptions, which is their double existence as material culture with a context. That's not because the 19th century epigraphers didn't recognize that, but publishing hundreds of thousands of inscriptions in that way was not possible. Um, so to take one very straightforward example, honours for Laparone, it's not simply a text, it's not simply a single piece of stone, it's actually part of a monumental exedra bench put up in the middle of the marketplace in the front of the portico in the Agora of Halaisu on the north coast in the second century and takes on a very different set of meanings in that context. Staying with Halaisu on the north coast, that illustrates a further problem, which is that those initial attempts to gather all the material in the late 19th, early 20th century, obviously were over 100 years ago, and a lot has changed since then. In the case of Halaisa, 10 inscriptions included in those pages at the bottom from 19th century corpora, now well in excess of 60 inscriptions, um, 
published often in multiple diverse local and often hard to obtain uh, publications. Until recently, the vast majority not on display, but in storerooms uh, and inaccessible. Um, and even then, a whole series beyond that of fragments, which in most epigraphic publications have tended to be omitted um, uh, as being hard to draw much meaning from um, and not deserving of, for example, the photography and the additional space within publication, paper publication. Um, but each of those stands proxy for another inscription at the very least, if one is going to begin to think about what is going on with texts um, and in Many of these cases you can work out which language, for example, though not all, and the material. Um, all of this uh, limits what one is able to do thus far with the material, and there are basic physical limitations to access as well, whether that is the obscure locations of inscriptions uh, uh, on walls behind springs on private property, um, or whether that is, for instance, simply physical size, meaning that for many museums and other situations, moving them out of storage is an almost insuperable challenge, meaning that they are not generally readily accessible. So if one's going to overcome the limitations of what the publication presents, actually then getting to the text is a further challenge in order to get, get more. But there's a second problem, which is not simply the one of actually getting to the material. The other problem, or another problem, is that of um, consideration, is that of epigraphic culture, which is to say the very decision, the very choice to put a text onto stone, or indeed any other durable material, um, to write for that matter, is in some sense a cultural choice. Not everybody is going to engrave a text on stone. Not all the peoples in the ancient Mediterranean chose to engrave texts on stone. Not everybody in the United Kingdom chooses to engrave texts on stone. On the other hand, as a concept, it's not unfamiliar. Um, uh, on, a, on a sunnier date than today, um, uh, exercising my brief rights to, to exercise, um, I popped into the local cemetery um, where you have a perfect example of epigraphic culture uh, in full, full flow, um, which is the ongoing tendency to engrave tombstones, uh, still probably the predominant uh, way in which we practice epigraphic culture today. But more than that, um, what that also can bring out um, are the particularities of epigraphic culture. Um, <laughs> granted, Oxford is a somewhat unusual place. Um, granted that I probably do have one or two colleagues who do converse occasionally in Latin. What these texts do not represent is the day-to-day -day speech of the people in the city of Oxford. Um, Nonetheless, it is a common practice, if you're engraving, to do so in Latin for a whole host of historical, traditional, prestige, symbolic, conventional reasons. Um, similar, not identical, but similar considerations apply if one is going to try to understand why people choose to put up texts in the first place of any sort, on stone or otherwise. In other words, epigraphic texts are not simply directly representative of what was going on, they're representative of a set of cultural choices. Now, decades ago, this point was made within the realms of ancient history, um, famously in a paper by Ramsay McMullen in what was called, in which he termed it the epigraphic habit, where he picked out the nature of the, one aspect of the nature of the epigraphic culture in the Roman Empire, fundamentally identifying the fact um, as this graph and many others can illustrate that the volume of inscriptions engraved on stone under the Roman Empire increases dramatically and rapidly from the time of Augustus through to the Severans around the 200 AD and then in the third century tapers off uh, even more dramatically in terms of uh, quantity and this is a pattern that can by and large be replicated across a very great deal of the Roman Empire. And indeed, one can see it in Sicily too, where the primary spike in epigraphic production on stone appears to fall in the first three centuries AD. But that's, in the Sicilian case at least, a very superficial observation. And indeed, concentrating on that distinctive Latin practice in isolation in an ancient Mediterranean that is itself, like Sicily, much more diverse, risks privileging one very particular feature, uh, which is of interest, and indeed difficult in some respects to explain, the exact motivations for that Latin epigraphic habit remain an extensive subject of debate among scholars. Um, but there is more to it than that. If you disaggregate the Sicilian material, for example, by language, then 
what becomes really quite clear quite quickly is that that Latin habit is indeed there. And the two lines I've drawn in represent in the, the, the creation of the Augustan Colonia in the late first century BC and um, Constantine and the uh, beginnings of the Byzantine uh, of, of Eastern Rome and the arrival of official Christianity in the fourth century AD, the Latin epigraphy of Sicily fundamentally falls in those three centuries. Um, but there is a rather different epigraphic culture at work on the island in Greek and indeed other epigraphic cultures in earlier periods in Punic and uh, bits and pieces in other languages too. And the totality together needs to be studied together in order to actually understand what is going on on the island uh, and between peoples uh, simultaneously in the same place very often. The picture is sometimes missed, not least because if one publishes Latin inscriptions in one volume and Greek inscriptions in another, they're not treated readily together. There are other ways that one can begin to think about this epigraphic culture on the island. So a couple of very brief and superficial examples. If one looks at the distribution of uh, inscriptions on stone as they are found across the island in the archaic period, so from the, the beginnings in the 7th century BC through to the 5th century, the classical period, uh, what one sees, um, besides the fact that they are relatively rare, um, is that these map very, by and large onto the diffusion of Greek uh, settlers on the island, um, in the southeast in particular, and then the, the, the settlement of Selenunte, Selenus uh, in the southwest, and the Phoenician settlement uh, of Motia uh, in the far west. Uh, those two cities with substantial but in turn distinct epigraphic cultures where the majority of the material is either funerary or votive religious dedications. Um, but it's a, it's a pattern of practice that follows uh, certain, certain communities and certain movements of settlement over time and in certain languages. It's a pattern that changes significantly as one moves into the Hellenistic period from the fourth century onwards, where the diffusion much more widely across the island also seems to stand in some ways as a proxy, uh, on a map at least, for the development of, of, of Hellenistic urbanism on the island, uh, monumental urbanization, much more widely in many, many uh, small but monumentalized urban centers. Um, in parallel with that, dividing this up in a different way, one of the things that one can see is uh, other underlying choices within that decision to in inscribe on stone. Marble uh, is not indigenous to Sicily. Um, there, is, there is no good marble uh, to be found on the island. There are some good compact limestones and some brushes, but no, no, no true marble. Um, and in the archaic epigraphy in the earlier period, uh, the epigraphy is almost entirely uh, on uh, local stone. Local stone remains the dominant material, but suddenly in the Hellenistic period, in parallel with this spread of monumental urbanization and the spread of epigraphic practice, what one starts to see is the use of imported, more costly, finer stone, precisely for the purpose of putting up texts of this sort. Um, so a clear shift in uh, what people are trying to do. This changes again when you get to the Roman period, and at that point, the use of marble really uh, takes off, uh, reflecting a range of different choices as well as a range of different economic uh, uh, commercial uh, um, circumstances. If one moves into the Roman imperial period, the distribution shifts again, the volume of material increases, um, but what one can see very clearly is an increased focus and concentration on the major coastal settlements. And this comes out especially clearly if for a moment we cut out all of the, the funerary material and concentrate simply on the public inscriptions, the non-funerary inscriptions, uh, at which point where one looks for the concentrations, what one basically is seeing is a map of the Roman colonies on the island as established by Augustus, uh, Syracuse, Catania, uh, Tindarus, um, uh, Termini, uh, Palermo, uh, and Lilibium. There are some exceptions to this. Agrigento stands out for a, a very superficially weak epigraphic culture, Taumina, Taumina similarly, um, but the pattern, the correlation is remarkably strong and striking. Now, all of this can be done more or less with the existing digital data set that, that has been built up um, in the iSicily project, which more in a moment. But all of this is also in many ways still quite crude, quite superficial, if 
at least superficially very satisfying um, and instructive. Um, it's working with very basic metadata um, on a very sweeping level. Um, but how do we move to start trying to explore that in greater depth to look at the sorts of things that we saw, for example, in the tombstone, those, those subtleties of linguistic interference, uh, of paleographic interference, that actually allow us to get far further than simply saying, this one uses Greek, this one uses Latin, this one uses Punic, um, uh, or similarly. Um, and to do that needs, obviously, much richer, much better data. Um, so that takes one towards the inspiration, the original inspiration, the ongoing inspiration for uh, trying to apply digital approaches in more depth in order to pull enough of that data together in sufficient depth um, to begin to attempt that sort of an analysis. That was where the original desire to develop the iSicily project came from, which is a project that's been funded uh, generously by my own university um, in recent years, uh, attempting to build a corpus in the first instance only of the stone inscriptions, currently about 3,300. The final total should probably be in the region of 4,500. Um, but all inscriptions in all languages across the whole of uh, antiquity from the 7th century BC to approximately the 7th century uh, CE, and in a free open access form, which is a theme that I'll come back to towards the end. Um, one reason it's not yet complete, despite having been the subject of work for many years, is limitations of resource, as well as uh, challenges of access. Um, and it's that process of trying to put this together and then trying to exploit it that I want to devote the second part of this talk to, which is around those challenges and also possibilities that trying to go fully digital in a sense entails. Now just at the level of going digital with the text is already a challenge that people have been wrestling with for a very long time. Um, simply displaying the, the inscription from the step of the Temple of Apollo uh, in Syracuse um, would be a challenge without Unicode. Uh, it would not display on your screens, it would not display on my screen. Um, but beyond that, um, how do you run a search of any detail, any uh, re refinement on a text like that? How do you run a word search when there are so many additional signs, symbols, complications, unusual symbols? Um, or even for that matter, on a word as simple as imperator, which in an epigraphic text could appear in any one of these and many more permutations. And that's without even going into uh, the, the challenges of linguistic uh, inflection. Um, one can overcome that with uh, fairly intensive search algorithms and programming, but that's devoting an awful lot of effort simply to some very basic tasks. Something which has made this much easier in recent years, um, or easier in one respect, um, has been the work of a much, much wider community of scholars in the first instance interested in manuscript studies, developing the text encoding initiative, and then a group of scholars, uh, Charlotte Rouchet, Tom Elliott, Gabby Boddard, and others, developing um, uh, a subset of that called Epidoc, um, all of which is essentially designed to enable one to render inscribed texts in a way that a computer can do something with easily and be instructed to read in easy fashion. To put this in a very simple example, a fragmentary inscription uh, on which the letters C-A-E are preserved uh, and which uh, one might very plausibly restore therefore to read Caesar, Kaiser, um, and which an epigrapher traditionally using what's called the Leiden conventions would mark up as uh, putting the SAR in square brackets um, it, to show that this has been a suggested restoration. Uh, encoding this instead for a computer, you essentially do the same thing, but you provide the computer with some information instead in a standardized form, uh, encoding the bit that is missing as being supplied and the reason that is lost, but you can already go further than that and you can start to actually provide information about the text on that as well. So you can go and say that this is a name. You could go further and say which name this is and additional information. But all of this can be added onto the text, marked up on the text in a way that can then be actioned and understood by a computer. And you can go further than that because you don't need to be limited to the text. You can begin to add in all of that other information that you would include in a normal edition, but you can encode all of that information in the same fashion so that a computer can uh, be 
programmed to make sense of it easily and exploit that information so that what one's actually doing is encoding an entire edition. This is not therefore a database with individual bits of data abstracted from other sources and put into separate pre-selected fields. This is rather a full edition in which you choose to then say that certain things are certain types of information. This becomes a particularly rebarbative, uh, highly encoded file that nobody would particularly wish to have to read. But the point is a computer can then be easily actioned to turn that into something that most human beings could read. For example, a web page or a printed, indeed the PDF for a printed publication. Or more so than that, a computer can then work across all of those files, all of those individual encoded editions, and search and pull out the individual pieces of information so that you're back to what looks like a database, but you're effectively running database type searches across a set of encoded editions. And that then in turn enables you to run the sorts of searches that one was wanting to run and which for originally one might have set about constructing a database for the thing that one was interested in to gather those pieces of information, whereas instead one's now abstracting those from a larger set of editions. The initial work to build those files involved a process of um, uh, tackling, confronting, gathering together the information from published sources. But that was very much just the first step. The fundamental phase two, if you like, is then the process of actually going out and identifying all of those individual inscriptions and carrying out a full fresh study of them, gathering actual imagery of them um, uh, and refining and improving the data that is available through a, a, an island-wide process of autopsy in order to make all of these additions as full and complete as they possibly can be and to enable then the most uh, data-rich uh, and fine-grained analysis that one might be able to undertake. That sort of study requires very extensive collaboration necessarily and rightly with one's Sicilian colleagues. Uh, that's the fun part of the whole project. Um, and especially the museums where the vast majority of the Sicilian inscriptions are held. Um, as a first stage in that, therefore, we set about constructing a database of the archaeological collections in Sicily. I say we, but this was fundamentally the work of a good friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Metcalf. Um, and we now have a database of some 155 archaeological collections in Sicily, which we can then cross-reference from the editions. Um, and that in turn enables us to create not just information pages about the individual collections, but to directly build from that uh, free linked searchable catalogues of the inscriptions in each museum as we're going along. And those can be accessed from the website, uh, read, downloaded and used freely. Um, that obviously serves multiple functions. It's not only useful to the researcher, it's uh, invaluable for visitors, it's invaluable for museum staff where these catalogues generally don't previously exist, um, and that creates enormous and ready opportunities for collaboration and local use. To take two obvious examples, it means that large inscriptions that are not easy to display can be made virtually accessible very readily. It means that inscriptions that are not yet published but are in fact on display, um, more information can readily be found about them. Um, and it becomes very easy to potentially leverage that, that information and start to make it more accessible more quickly. So a very straightforwardly simple way to improve display by the use of QR codes to connect to those digital editions. I want to very briefly look at one particular example of that collaboration that took place primarily in 2016, 2017, which was with the Civic Museum at Catania, um, where, uh, which holds a collection of several hundred inscriptions from the island, primarily almost all from the, uh, the, the Roman colony of Catania itself, uh, but all of which were essentially in storage uh, and for which there was only uh, a paper uh, catalog uh, in the past published but um, on paper. Um, and this, this arose out of a multi, um, multiple collaboration with the Institute of Cognitive Sciences and Technology in Catania, the Civic Museum, the Comune, um, Oxford and the Isisli project, and crucially the Liceo Artistico Statale Lazzaro in Catania, a, a large art state school, um, where 
starting from the, if you like, more standard and traditional activity of going and talking to the students and looking at what epigraphy is, how one uh, studies inscriptions and ancient Catania and the place of inscriptions within ancient Catania, we rapidly moved through this collaboration to the students themselves working in the museum, identifying the inscriptions in the stores, um, studying them, cataloging them and recording them into um, digital form as well. Uh, and at the culmination of that, actually undertaking the entire work of designing and constructing what is now a, a permanent 35 inscription exhibition over three rooms in the museum, making the epigraphic heritage of Catania actually visible again to both tourists and the local community. Um, and almost all the work of which was done by local school students um, in Catania. Um, now, I mean, that was enormous fun, uh, but at the same time, it actually enabled, um, and there is also now a digital website of all of those inscriptions made available by the Institute of Cognitive Technology as well um, in Catania, uh, the Epicom project. Um, and, uh, but what that did was also achieve far more than I would ever achieve on my own, um, uh, and brought together a whole range of different expertise um, to in turn bring several hundred inscriptions within the data set to record them, to photograph them, uh, and much more, while simultaneously enabling the museum to do much more with its collections um, and enabling the local community to engage with its heritage. There is then essentially a need to collaborate extensively in order to try and actually make progress in this sort of um, field. And that collaboration takes many forms um, and should be constructive and productive, um, uh, sitting uh, not in lockdown uh, and in the room, as it were, behind me. Uh, last summer, students actually engaging in the process of editing some of these files and editions and learning in the process how to actually undertake such epigraphic encoding so that one can combine the process of building a project of this scale and scope uh, with actually training the next generation um, of epigraphers. Um, but one of the things that I think is important to stress and emphasize within that sort of process is that this is not simply, as it were, the exploitation of free labor. Um, uh, on the one hand, it's actually training and learning in new techniques. Um, but on the other hand, it should not be exploitation. And one of the things that digital approaches, I think in many ways make slightly easier at least give the opportunity to make easier um, than others, is that one can be much more detailed, fine-grained um, and comprehensive in recording who has actually done what and when, and therefore give credit where credit is due and not simply make this all about me, all about my project, but actually say who has done what throughout this project on every file and when. Um, but that in turn raises another set of questions and challenges, um, which is around, whether we actually do then give people credit for that sort of activity. Um, were a student to present a CV which said that they had edited several hundred of these, what credit would they actually get for it? Um, because sitting around that question is a question around how we view and treat this sort of thing, work as a publication or not. Um, I've made repeated attempts um, uh, to uh, stress the idea that this is about editions and not simply a database. It gathers together editions and the editions can be put into a database, but it is not itself a database. It is a set of ongoing, continuously edited and revised editions. How though would one cite them? People remain very wary of citing purely digital, born digital publications, not least because there's such a diversity of them and it's hard to judge them. We more or less have a set of conventions. I mean, there are abbreviations that I would like people to use, but we have a set of conventions about how you would cite a web page more or less, and most bibliographic conventions now exist for doing this. But crucially within that is this point that one of the things that one should include is the date of access. But that immediately highlights the challenge around so much of this and the, I think the reticence of so many people to cite such work. How sustainable is it? How long will that web page be there? And in this particular case, and in some ways an element I'm more interested in right now, what happens when that file is revised? Because we keep going back, we keep finding more information, we keep editing it further, and so on. You cited that, you cited it in April, in April 2019 and uh, published your piece on it, uh, discussing it and using that edition. Annoyingly, in 
uh, December of that year, I went back and I discovered it said something completely different and I now republish it. And so if somebody else goes to that web page now, they will see something that looks different and they will think that you made a mistake in reading the, 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 the online publication or that something else is awry. Um, this makes it necessary in turn to, if you're going to provide that level of reassurance, you have to take an extra set of steps. And that revolves around making accessible and preserving archived copies of every revision, which is non-trivial, but actually in no sense impossible, because then you can actually point people to the, that edition at that moment in time and its permanently preserved form. Maintaining the front end, the website, maintaining the nice fancy iSicily website with its search interface and so on is not actually the point. Maintaining each of the, the editions in a stable published digital file is the point. And that's a slightly separate thing because the website is about enabling you to query multiple things in different ways as opposed to the core data of the edition. And one of the things that we spend a lot of effort trying to develop is a, is a pipeline, if you like, which enables us to put all the individual inscriptions at each revision in both a human readable PDF and an XML document into, in this case, the CERN funded Zenodo repository, which uh, should last as long as most digital repositories are likely to last um, and gives a reasonable degree of confidence and which provides a digital object identifier for every individual inscription. So that offers one possible solution to trying to persuade people of a sense the, that it's worth citing these things because they will still be there in some time. And again, that it includes all the information about who did what. So in turn, claiming credit for the work you have done can be to some sense, in some sense, uh, supported. Publication takes me on to the last few things I want to say uh, in that publication is only one aspect in turn of accessibility. I stressed the point about all the data being available. Um, and in the final few minutes, I want to just think a little bit about um, how the data, the implications, the challenges of open and linked data when one is putting together this sort of uh, data set. So at base, all of the data, that is all of those encoded files for Sicily, is freely available and anybody can download it, take it away, do what they want with it. The question, of course, in part is whether that is of any use to anybody and what you might do with it um, and how one ensures that, in fact, it is useful in some sense. One of the aims of iSicily, just to take a specific, sort of slightly tangential, but I hope explanatory uh, uh, example, one of the aims of iSicily in origin was to offer a single point of reference for each inscription, because many of these inscriptions have been published five, 10, 15, even 20 times in different places over the years. Um, and that leads to endless confusion um, in the literature. Um, now, digital has in some ways complicated this picture. If you do a quick trawl through some of the existing online databases for inscriptions, you will find a very diverse world of uh, Sicilian inscriptions across those, all referenced in different ways um, and accessible in different numbers. Any attempt to try and assess how many inscriptions there were in ancient Sicily can immediately be shown to be fundamentally challenging by comparing uh, what each of these different data sets offers. But in fact, the one at the center of these uh, called Trismegistos points the way towards how one gets out of that particular conundrum. Sicily can present a unique number for each Sicilian inscription, but if every one of these other projects is still pointing to them in other ways, that doesn't get us very much further. Um, Trismegistos, uh, a project based in Leuven, um, has set out with the uh, hugely ambitious um, uh, aim of um, providing unique identifier for every single inscription in the ancient Mediterranean world. Um, uh, and indeed beyond. Um, and what that in turn means is that iSicily and other projects can simply say, my number is that Trismegistos number. And we have a single point of reference maintained by one project, which all projects can then allude to. So within any iSicily encoded edition, that Trismegistos number uh, now appears and can be linked. That in turn means that different projects know what they're talking about. That points to a wider problem, which is the general more abstract problem about data, which is how do you know that you're talking about the same thing? And um, uh, to take a more specific example within this project, um, how do I know and everybody else know that we're all talking about the same place? And how can you find all of the inscriptions that come from that same place? Because the inscriptions that come from modern Adrano, 
well, it used to be called Aderno. Um, the Greeks called it Adranon or Hadranon. The Romans called it Hadranum. It has various other names as well. Which name are you using? And how do I know that what that project is using is the same name or not? Um, and again, the answer lies in finding a single common denominator, which points to all of those can point to all of those. And in for ancient geography, we're extremely well served in this sense by a project called Pleiades, uh, which provides these unique references for each ancient place, uh, which in turn gather together those different ancient names and modern names, uh, but mean that whatever I choose to call it in my project, as long as I say it's also place 462074 in Pleiades, we can all say actually work out and the computers crucially can work out that we're talking about the same thing. So comparably in some ways to Trismegistos, the Pelagios project then pulls together and aggregates all of the projects that are using those uh, identifiers, which means that you can search collectively across multiple data sets for the same place. Um, and in turn other projects, and here we go full circle, can then go to Pelagios and say, so tell me, uh, show me all of the places that are referring to this place and you get linked back to the fact that if you were to go into Pleiades and look at a particular place you will also in turn get links to the other projects that have resources that point to that place. Linked open data. Specifically within the world of epigraphy, the Eagle project uh, directed by Silvio Orlandi in recent years, uh, among its many uh, achievements, attempted to put together a set of vocabularies of this sort specifically for epigraphers, so that when we talk about a funerary inscription, we all can point to the same identifier, even if we're using any one of these many different terms to describe it within our projects. Now, in principle, all of that and all of that data and all of that autopsy and all of it encoded and digitized gets us towards the holy grail of being able to do really complex, really interesting historical analysis of what's going on where and how it's interacting with other places and how it compares to other places and other peoples over time. The reality is it takes, as I've already been discovering with the Isisley project, a huge amount of time, effort, and resource, above all human resource, because most of this can't still be the basic epigraphist's work, cannot yet, in some ways one hopes never, be automated. Um, and actual illustrations of this at work, outside of that particular case of the, 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 with the geographic data of Pleiades are extremely rare. I single out almost the only one I've really seen to date uh, by Pietro Liuzzo, who worked on the Eagle project uh, previously, um, who has looked at multiple projects which do precisely this in terms of comparing, uh, in terms of cross-referencing their data with these agreed standards, enabling him to pull that data from multiple projects and actually start to do things as here in one small example, compare Ethiopic epigraphic practices with Sicilian epigraphic practices in the same period over time. There's a much greater range of data attempts that he's, he's, he's undertaken there. Um, but that begins to give a first hint of actually what one could begin to achieve uh, through uh, such practices. But I'm both getting ahead of myself and running out of time. Um, the current data set, as I've rather suggested, is uh, somewhat limited. Uh, stone even, and even not, doesn't even have all of the stone in it, but stone is only a very particular subset of textual written epigraphic culture, the material of graffiti, of ceramics, of inscribed objects of all categories and so on, broadens this out hugely and would change our understandings considerably if it could be brought together. And that's where I hope the, uh, the, the next phase, um, uh, the grant agreement was signed last Friday, will take us, which is the, the, the Crossreads project. I have a feeling I saw Charlotte Rouchet's name on the list of participants, and I must acknowledge Charlotte for having, in a passing moment, suggested that catchy acronym. Um, but um, uh, the, the Crossreads project over the next five years with ERC funding aims to start to try to firstly really comprehensively put together that data set but at the same time to start to explore some of those very particular, more nuanced, fine-grained types of analysis. So actually uh, encoding the linguistic uh, 
patterns within the text, the linguistic forms within the text, so that one can begin to explore across languages what might be going on, actually encoding the letter forms and systematically studying the changing letter forms over all of this material, um, and actually um, something epigraphers are dreadfully bad at in general um, in terms of identifying stone, on this occasion actually scientifically studying the petrology of the stones in use so that we can begin to get some sense of the cultural and economic significance of the use, the, the materials actually in use as well. Um, all of which in a sense is to say, um, perhaps you might invite me back in five years time and I'll tell you what I've actually found out. Um, but thank you very much if you're still listening.